I've been getting to know the Florida Everglades for the last 20 years. Driving between spring training baseball camps or taking a few days off for fishing, I came to think of this area as untouchable. But recently, I've had to change my mind. As Florida develops, so must the glades be forced to change. This is Kurt Gowdy, and today in this spot, there's an emergency. Right now, we're in a place called Conservation Area Number 3. It's the Florida Everglades, about 40 miles northwest of Miami. In the last five years, the water has risen in here three feet. And it's that rise of three feet of water that all outdoorsmen should be really concerned about. Guiding us in here is Lieutenant Tom Shirley of the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission. And coming down from his headquarters in Washington, D.C., is the executive director of the National Wildlife Federation, Mr. Tom Kimball. And Tom, I imagine years before all these ditches were built in here and the water uh, came up, this must have been a fantastic wildlife area. The concentrations and variety of the species were unbelievable. Uh, uh, many of our red book endangered species, such as our national symbol, the bald eagle, uh, the roseate spoonbill, uh, the flamingo, egrets, countless water birds, uh, the American alligator, Florida cougar, a panther, was here and was one of the great mammal predators here in the glades. This was at one time one of the greatest wilderness areas before uh, man came in and began to build uh, the canals and uh, put up the berms and do the dredging and drainage and, and then the roads for people to traverse across. This is a great barrier of water flow that, that inhibits this water from flowing as it did naturally. You say flowing, this isn't a marsh? No, uh, that's the unusual thing about and the uniqueness of the Everglades is that this is a great river. Why did they come in here and, and put in these canals and all this ditches to raise the water level here? For the primary benefit of man, to protect uh, great cities like Miami from floods that uh, come in high water drain lands for agriculture. This is a subtropical climate that uh, grows tomatoes all through the winter and other produce that our populations up north need. So they, they drain great areas of land for agriculture, uh, need potable water for our great cities, uh, put in our homes and our great hotels. And this created a need for the storage of water and manipulation of water. There's all of these uh, uh, reasons why it was necessary to try and manipulate the flow of this great river. We didn't mention one animal, the deer. Yes, it's, it's been this high water that's caused the serious deer problem we've had. Pumping water into these areas when they have too much everywhere and bringing the water levels up above the food chain is what's caused all the trouble. For example, five years ago, there were 7,800 deer in this conservation area three of about 700,000 acres, and that's a tremendous acreage. And now it's down to 400 because of this high water and man's goofing up the deer's environment. And these little islands that we've been seeing around here in these Everglades, these actually do help save the deer, huh? There's no question about it that uh, deer in the Everglades, when the water is high, have to get out of the water sometime. Who builds these islands, Tom? Well, uh, here again, it's just been interested sportsmen who uh, come to love the Everglades and, uh, and want to uh, preserve the habitat, taken of their own time, spent their own money, and used their own equipment to come in here and build some of these islands. And then the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission, they pitched in, and it's becoming now a joint effort. I understand some of the citizens even came in here and worked with the commission in trying to capture the deer and save them. Is that true? Really took some physical effort on the part of the uh, people who were sincerely interested in the problem. And they did save some of the deer that way. Yes, they did. In 1966, they, they took 400 deer out of this area because of the high water. You know, uh, we have millions of viewers on the American Sportsman each year, and I know uh, only a few can come in and, and build islands like this in the Everglades to help save the deer. Well, what can they do in their own local areas? There are environmental problems similar to the Everglades in every community. It might be a polluted stream, it might be an air pollution problem, it might be the incursion of a highway and open space and parks near an urban area. Take a look around you and then get together in a united action with other citizens who have similar uh, interests and concern about what's happening 
and then go to our policymakers and demand to have some input as to the kind of America we are all uh, interested in and improving the quality of environment that makes it better for all of us. Seven hundred thousand acres on either side of me is in jeopardy. Much of the wildlife here has already died. The survival of the rest depends on work, thoughtful men, and plenty of luck. Back in 1959, the Florida Game and Freshwater Commission warned that water control would be the key to survival of wildlife in this area. You know, every community in this country has a conservation area problem. It's time to acknowledge that the problem isn't always somebody else's. And it's time to make sure that a professional ecologist is represented on every community board that holds our environment in trust. You know, it's time to accept that when we have to say, who killed the Everglades? Who killed the woods? Who killed the salmon? Who poisoned the waters? Who killed the bald eagle? It's already too late, and it was us. Next year, the American sportsman will be back again, traveling the world for more adventures and challenges in nature. This is your host, Kurt Gowdy, thanking you very much for watching our programs this year. And remember, if you care for the out of doors, do something about it. Thank you.
the middle of the Florida Everglades, the largest marshland in the state of Florida, to include the United States. Great migrations of birds come down each winter to migrate during the winter time. We're going to take a trip way on back into the Everglades and let you see what some of the sportsmen and people that enjoy the outdoor recreation in the Everglades area. These are some of the types of equipment that we use. This is an airboat. This was taken some time ago. This is my first little back airboat. Very much different from the usual during that period, but out in the 60s, it was our new design. So follow me as we make our trip up on into the other place. It's a nice, placid area, crisp skies, white fluffy clouds. It really gives you a feeling of free spirit. Faster boats get up close to 100 and possibly even drag. cutting across and hopefully we can see some deer. Oh, there's a nice buck. Yeah, this is probably a six or an eight point. Uh, nice size buck. They take right through the water in the marsh and that's very much a part of the natural habitat. Got a horsepower Franklin. And that was before we moved into the, the larger 240s and 0540s and all. But this old boat did pretty good during the time. form it packed mud and grass and water wasn't too much water but uh, pretty much demolished the airboat it uh, broke it across the bottom off the top somehow broke every spark plug off the top of the engine brand new prop it was mud and stuff of my eyes for several months after that I guess the wildlife around heard it for quite some distance This is the old conventional type airboats that we had back during this time period. And we went put on back into the big cypress. And we were looking to deer. We moved deer. To work with uh, game management personnel, we would uh, catch some of these deer and uh, tag them, check their weight, and move them to other areas to check their migration patterns. And some of the deer, they were pretty aggressive. This, especially this little buck here, he, he didn't want to run. He, he just wanted to stay there and fight him well. It was sort of amusing, but uh, he was an aggressive little buck. You have to be 
be careful of their hooves. Their hooves are actually more dangerous than, than their antlers. In the bucklands, uh, and sometimes the hooves are like a knife blade. I've had them cut right into a brand new pair of Levi's, just like a switchblade. So the hooves are much more dangerous than the uh, antlers. There several ways we, we captured deer. This is a, a blowgun that I've made up myself, my own device for uh, capturing the deer. It was a piece of brass made out of uh, some golf tees and so forth. But it proved to be very effective on uh, capturing the, the deer. Uh, the game management personnel. There was a nice, uh, looked like a nice eight point buck. But we were trying to ease up on it, but you have to be careful of the cockmouths. So they, they will bite you if given an opportunity. But luckily, they're not, they're not as aggressive near as much as the eastern diamondback. They usually try to bluff you. And given a half a chance, they'll, they'll roam on off. There's very few of those left in the Everglades any longer. So that was a nice buck. We was trying to get within range with the, the blowgun. And the blowgun was real effective because uh, there was no noise to speak of involved. And then when they, the dart d hit him, he didn't, uh, it didn't scare him at all. He might have thought it was a horse fly lighting on him or something and it only took a few seconds uh, for it to take effect. You can see the dart in his right hind quarter. So we wait just uh, a few minutes for him to take an effect and it doesn't take very long at all. So approximately uh, 9,000 head of deer inside of the, the number two and number three conservation area. We had a very good deer management program during that period, and we had a lot of trouble with the uh, are very good for the Everglades as long as they're not uh, mismanagement uh, through uh, letting the mucklands get too dry. But when they do, the mucklands can bring the island. So you see how the buck that really uh, gets on a person. But the fires under control conditions of the proper season is, is a natural thing and very good for the Everglades. would come in by the hundreds of thousands and they would nest. You could depend on nesting every year in the Everglades. It's large flocks. At times the ground would be literally black and covered with the young chicks being born. Even the, uh, the birds uh, made their nest in the sawgrass. Full flight. You could hear them, there'd be so many, you'd hear them far off in the distance as the wings flap loose through the air. Large alligator holes was in the area during this time. We had the Florida crocodile. There was many in the brackish water area. They seemed to be much more powerful and much faster than our Florida alligator. These are crocodiles. You don't see many of them around any longer.
who come into the rookeries at night. An awful lot of noise. Very impressive. These people as the sun went down in the late afternoon. The alligators would begin to be more active. You'd make camp. In the night you hear all the various types of animals and the birds. And early the next morning, the birds would take off by the thousands. They'd take literally tons of freshwater fish to feed these many thousands of birds. That's what the Everglades is all about. 